very stimulating, very interesting, but I have a series of questions and challenges to Hans Hermann Hoppe on this. Um, the way you, um, let's say, in my view, trying to identify who is the, the best audience, the groups you rely on to build the movement, and what you emphasize. I would say, to be a bit provocative, I think the, uh, it's, it's not the kind of group I would rely on. And let's say this kind of emphasis on neighborhoodness, on, on social cohesion, and, uh, community of values, there is something there. But it's, for me, it makes too much like parochialism. Uh, I'm a cosmopolitan, I'm living in London, working f with, with global clients, and we are always, we draw talents from around the world. Of course, we have a community of values, so I agree with this. I'm an anti multiculturalist, and I want to criticize all sorts of backward cultures which still exist be and as dysfunctional because they're dysfunctional and non prosperity dri driving. They can't sustain themselves, they can't pay for themselves because they're all subsidized. That's why we have these pockets of backward cultures. They would disappear on themselves once the subsidies were withdrawn. I would believe in this. But I'm not disturbed by the floor claw, by the way they say hello. I never say hello to any of my neighbors. I've never talked to a single of my neighbors. <laughs> I'm happy with this atomization of a world society, global society, and rely on private provision of, of insurance, of, of health care. And I don't need necessarily even a family, community. Families break down that we divorce after three, four years every time. It's all okay with me. So I think, I think uh, um, that's a kind of different spirit. I'm also, who would I not want to build on this kind of uh, suburban, leftover, uh, in disenfranchised, white um, um, Trump voters or, or those people who run after the alt-right wouldn't be the primary audience. I wouldn't write off the elites, bankers, lawyers, um, 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 you have university professors sitting right here. And for me, actually, the primary audience what I would build on is actually the Marxists, those youth who have a passion, who believe in, 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 in intervening in society, uh, in, uh, in that there's a science and economics and socially based a kind of appraisal of where society could move, who want to think about the project of humanity forward. I was a Marxist, you were a Marxist. I know so many who moved over to the libertarian movement. So that, that would be a counter challenge, a different worldview. The kind of people I want to associate with, the kind of people I want to build the movement with, I also still believe that there is a, um, a kind of political project and political party building, a cater building, and not only the parochial decentralization project, I see the potential of taking over a certain place, a country, let's say. For me, the, the vision is the next round of crises which are bound to come, and uh, something like an advanced country like a Scotland going into secession, then totally tanking into, into trying a kind of socialism and tanking deeply, being kind of bankrupt, and have the people ready who's been predicting this to, to build up a kind of group, a party, who can lead the rollback and offer solutions on that scale, not a kind of local scale. I also love, of course, what Titus is trying somewhere in, 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 in uh, um, middle America, a small state, a small adventure, but that takes a long time and will be marginal and far away. So I think there should be a political project, and if I, in the same I feel, where is the next Rothbard, uh, where is the new um, uh, Ron Paul, somebody who's taking the large national stage, a global political stage, the activism, uh, the cater building, the, uh, not only the theoretical building, and not the, the small project, but, but entering kind of political arena on, on that level. Just throwing out a few points here. So, so that's where, where I'm, I'm standing with a lot of you have been saying from the wonderful conference, but I just feel, is it maybe misunderstanding you, uh, but I, I'm a cosmopolitan who, who, who wants to connect up with, uh, with, um, uh, with, the, with, with, with various um, uh, libertarians, and I wonder, another thing, what you're doing, understand it, but I know it from the left, first of all, this sociological identification of the groups you want to build, and there's some truth in there, but also you have to be totally open, who else, whoever's coming, and the other thing I see, the kind of aggressive sectarianism, nearly, isn't it that, uh, when you say, liberal alas, Friede, Freude, Eierkuchen, libertarians, fake libertarians, and you carve out your root, and, and, and I understand that there's a forum and a, a room and a point for this, and, uh, but I'm also wondering if that's um, the best way forward to build the movement when we when we really have to we have to uh, have an inroad. I'm very impatient. I've, I've I've been waiting. I want things. I want to kick ass and move and 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 make this happen. Uh, that's my pitch. <laughs> and question. There's a challenge and question here. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 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 yeah, 
I'm not quite sure what the question in, in, in all of that was. Um, yeah. <laughs> in a way, of course, I'm also a cosmopolitan in the sense that what I uh, explained what libertarianism is, I think that these are universal values, but you have to recognize that some people adhere to them more closely and other people adhere to them less closely. Um, uh, you also have to uh, be clear about what world you are talking about when, if you want to have some change. And the world that we are currently inhabiting is obviously a world that has been taken over by insane people. Um, that this entire political correctness movement has been promoted by and large by Marxists, by reformed Marxists, by Gramsciite Marxists, not of course the classical Marxists who believe in the nationalization of all industries. That sort of thing is long gone. But the turn that the lefts have taken after the uh, collapse of Soviet style communism was of course this march through the institutions, um, trying to destroy what we would call the bourgeois culture. Everything that was considered to be normal is nowadays something that people just have to defend themselves. You almost, you almost have to just justify that you are what you are, um, that you are a white, white male and are married and have children and all the rest of it. Uh, you almost must excuse yourself for this. Um, and my purpose was obviously then to, yeah, to tell people who are normal standard people that there is nothing wrong with being normal standard people. Um, and um, that this problem that we have created in the recent years on a massive scale of, yeah, by government fiat forcing people to live together who wish not to live together, that this is a big problem that leave, leads to, yeah, to the destruction of everything that we and our parents and our grandparents consider to be the standard way of life. Maybe just about this cosmopolitanism. Yes, I travel around too. I have seen lots, par lots of parts of the world. Um, but I would not want to live at any part of the world. As a tourist, that is something entirely different. Um, I'm also in favor of free trade, um, as I made perfectly clear. So I'm in favor of globalization in the sense of, yeah, yes, of course, I'm, I'm glad that the division of labor expands uh, throughout the entire world, that we can benefit from things that people do in far away places, uh, and that we contribute something to their life by doing what we do at our place. But the idea that people who are very different can live in peaceful relationships next door to each other, I think is an illusion, unless you always close your door and don't care about your neighbors at all. Can I come back one with one quick point on this? We have to look at the economics of a globalized world. Global companies like mine, we have 50 nationalities, they come from all the world. They become very similar very quickly, super quickly, if they have to fend for themselves and pay their lives for themselves. Google these places, they have nationalities. We need the whole world talent pool and in London all these various origins that live close together with each other and we move around, we have an origin, we have a place, I might be living in New York. So that's the world we live in. That's the world which empowers the prosperity potentials and not some kind of parochial uh, 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 community which, which wants to be homogenous. They can, I'm no, not against look, it, but no, they won't. They won't my, but that was not my point. My point. Yeah, okay. If, if, yeah, if sure. people want to have that type of community, they are, they are welcome to have that type of community. 
but people who don't want to have that type of community are currently forced to accept a type of yeah. community that they do not want. Uh, actually, it shouldn't be any force, but why also we make a prediction, the kind of hom craving for homogene homogeneous local, local, this will not be viable. These communities, you, which you vote for the uh, for, for the Trumps and for the, for the alt-right, they're actually not self-sustaining. They're the welfare recipients too. And I don't predict them to be uh, a prosperity engines. So it's a, I think it's a, it's a short-sighted craving for homogeneity traditionalism, which is not gonna deliver the world next prosperity uh, 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 stage. If you look at all the world, the world and see where the major conflicts are, uh, where people kill each other, those are all multicultural societies. If you look at Switzerland, how did Switzerland solve this problem by delegating most of the powers to the canton? They had a single canton, I think Jura or so, that was multi, multilinguistic. They had terrorist acts there. Then they split the canton to create some sort of homogeneity. Look at all countries of the world, you'll see whenever you have very different cultures some sort of civil war situation exists. Uh, Hans, a, a little add-on uh, question. There are two uh, regions that both of us know uh, quite well, that is uh, the Middle East and uh, Austria-Hungary. And both seem to be cases in point uh, that uh, uh, living together with different languages, religions, in the end doesn't work out. But then at the same time, it seems to be that it works out quite well uh, you, in, in the cities, in the harbors, in the centers like Vienna, like uh, Izmir, Smyrna uh, before, like Beirut. Uh, uh, and wasn't it just nationalism and geopolitical interventionism that made all this powder cake explode? Or do you think there are some conditions under which uh, this kind of conviviality is possible in the wrong, long run? Or do, do you uh, think that uh, it confirms your hypothesis that in the end uh, it'll fail and, and ha have to fail? No, but what I think, there will be of course places, especially big cities, where you have uh, more multiculturalism, if you will, and you have other areas where you will have less of it. Um, even in the big cities, however, there was some sort of physical separation between the different groups. You do have so gr Greek districts, Turkish districts, you have Czech districts, Austria, the German German speaking districts and so forth with some overlapping territories, but there has always been a voluntary separation. And of course you are right that polit politics has aggravated the differences between them, has made it more difficult for these people to get along. Uh, there's always a possibility that you incite hatred against one group in order to loot the loot the, their property and so forth. Yes, in different locations, different arrangements are possible. Um, but even in multicultural big cities, you can see if you look on the micro level, you can see there is some separation with some overlaps. Also countries where they speak two languages, uh, both groups speak the other language, but some people don't learn the language of their neighboring group. Um, so it depends on the, on the circumstances. The only thing that we have to attack is the idea of forced integration. Um, and what we are suffering from is precisely forced integration. That uh, People have told us, force us, you must accept these people and you must also pay them and you must pay them more than you pay those people that are already living here longer, to refer to Angela Merkel. Okay, uh, Hans, uh, people have said many things about me, but um, I'm not aware that anyone's ever called me a flatterer or a sycophant, and so I hope you will take these words as completely honest. I, I think the speech that we've just heard this afternoon is in its technical sense and in its clarity of utterance, probably the best speech I have ever heard from you. You have spoken very clearly as the acknowledged head of our movement, 
And I personally would hope to see that the words you uttered this afternoon were spread very quickly throughout the entire libertarian movement and were put in front of anyone who is honestly interested to know what is the difference between the libertarian movement and the alt-right. So thank you for having said what you said this afternoon. Since that was not important. Well, I agree with the gaps, of course, but uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, I absolutely agree with uh, Professor Hobbes that uh, uh, the American Libertarian Party consists of libertarians, para-libertarians, pseudo-libertarians, fake libertarians, and so on, uh, and also as right is uh, differentiated. But there are two points on American uh, political map. One is Patrick Buchanan, mentioned by you. I remember him from 30 years ago, he was neither paleo-conservative nor libertarian. Perhaps he changed uh, now, I don't know. But the second point is the American Conser Constitution Party. It is, uh, where is there is the American Constitution Party. There is such a party in the United States. It is 1% one, 1 of voices and so on. It is, it is very much in American system. system. And I think it is worth, worth mentioning. Let me just say this is about Pat Buchanan, what I think is ad admirable about Pat Buchanan. He has always been a non-interventionist in foreign policies. He was always of the opinion after communism fell apart. He was a cold warrior before. Um, but after communism fell apart, he said NATO should be dissolved. The United States should withdraw all its troops from foreign countries and just care about itself. This part, given the fact that you have in America the so-called neoconservatives, whose uh, most cherished uh, conviction is to make war all over the world, um, uh, given uh, the ascendance of the neoconservatives, uh, Pat Buchanan was always a brave fighter against these tendencies. So in terms of his foreign policy, he is, he is a great asset to the United States, uh, a brave man. As far as his economics is concerned, I indicated that I think he is a fool when it comes to his economics. I have a question for Stefan. Um, regarding contract, um, and it's this. Uh, you define contract as uh, the encounter of volunty, of the, the, the two parties agreeing, consent. Um, in, in Roman law, the definition of contract was consent, but also enforceability. So first question is, what do you make of enforceability in your theory of contract? Second, uh, consent is often very hard to define, especially in modern contracts, which are the most interesting ones. There are contracts where consent is implied. For example, I park my car in a parking lot and I, it is implied that I have to pay the, the fee, but maybe I don't understand. And then there's a, another very interesting part of con theory of contracts, which is error, which is uh, to do if one of the parties makes a mistake in the, in the manifestation of its uh, volunty. So how do you solve these hard issues in contract law and how do you, do you think is there a libertarian answer to these questions or should we just resort to the traditional theory of contracts, Roman law, common law and so on? I think the latter is basically the answer. Um, I, I had in my slides enforcement, but I didn't have time to get there. It's not really a, doc a part of the doctrine of contract theory how you enforce them. Uh, the idea is that um, under the title transfer theory of contract, uh, it indicates who the owner of a resource is. So if someone owes the debt and they actually have money but they refuse to pay it, then theoretically according to the contract, uh, the debtor is in possession of property now of the creditor. But then that problem turns to the issue of how do you collect property that's basically stolen or held by someone who refuses to return it. Okay, so then that's a separate libertarian question. 
Um, I imagine there would be a court system, a judgment, something like that. As for the fine points of the doctrine of error, which is in the civil law, you're right, and uh, implicit consent, um, yeah, we can have some things to say about that, but I believe that you know, we, we can only go so, so far with our libertarian reasoning from the armchair, right? So we can come basic principles, root them in property theory, but any actual practicing, practical legal system will evolve um, uh, will evolve from cases and context like the Roman law did, like the civil law has, like the common law has. Uh, so I think basically we can, we can resort to the developed bodies of law of the Roman law and civil law and the common law for a more practical fleshed out system, but just keeping in mind our more refined and sort of slightly tuned version of the first principles. Um, I, I have no problem with uh, some, some, some libertarians rebel against the idea of implicit contracts, but I think it's unavoidable because a contract can never specify every conceivable, uh, foreseeable circumstance. So it always has to have a mechanism either implied or presumed or built in to have a procedure to decide what happens when the contract doesn't address something that happened. So usually that's called suppletive, S-U-P-P-L-E-T-I-V-E, -E, suppletive law or gap filler law. Uh, and you know, what you could say is that if, if parties live in a given jurisdiction or they sign up to a given legal system or a given arbitral procedure or a given insurance company procedure, they are generally aware of the way courts address these issues when they arise. And if they wanted to contract out of it, they would have bargained to put something in the in the fine print to deal with that, and if they don't, they have little complaint if the court has to try to find a fair solution to this unexpected uh, case. Uh, in the case of you know going, you go into a restaurant, you don't make a contract explicitly with the restaurant that you'll pay the prices. Sometimes you don't even look at the prices because if you order a glass of wine, you assume that it's within a certain range. If they bring you a, a bill for ten thousand dollars, that's out of what everyone would have expected. You know, if it's $20 and you thought it was 10, you probably have to pay that. So custom has to inform a lot of this. Actual practice has to inform a lot of this. Um, because we, we live in a world where language has been corrupted and, and, and uh, we live in a world of total conceptual confusion and, and, and uh, deliberate mis, uh, misrepresentation of people's points of view, I think it's sometimes imperative to stress the obvious. Um, when you say you are against forced integration, it's important to also say you're also against forced segregation. So I'm sure you don't agree with the white supremacist alt-right, which would want, for example, laws against what they would call miscegenation. That is equally repulsive to the libertarian ideal. I'm sure you feel that way, but Absol some, it, absolutely. it's absolutely important yeah. to stress the obvious, yeah. no matter how obvious. obvious. Yeah. yeah, it's obvious. Um, I mean, I, I think I did make clear where I agree, disagree with uh, at least parts of the old right. I mean, they, uh, if, if you want to have uh, a white national state, national state what, what do you do with people who live there right now who, who do not fall into that category? Uh, and uh, as I emphasized, I, uh, we have we have to blame f first of all our our white leaders for the evil that we are confronted with. Um, it is it is Mrs. Merkel who, who bears most of the responsibility for the immigration crisis that we have in Europe, you can hardly blame those people coming if she says, uh, you come and we will feed you. Um, I would probably would come too and want to be fed if somebody invites me at the expense of other people to come. Um, so th most of the blame has to be put on, on the white leaders in our countries who have caused this, this entire mess. And given that, the position that some alt-right people take sounds ridiculous to me. Um, the idea of socialism, uh, classical socialism, was also an idea that was, after all, created by white males. 
Um, so my my emphasis was only yes we 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 have to have to see who have these people chosen as the groups that they want to destroy in order to increase their own power who so this white male so to speak who try to undermine um the homogeneity of societies in order to gain more power through the classical policy of divide the people as much as possible, make them all dependent on the state in order to increase our own powers. Stefan, a question for you regarding contract law. Um, I found very interesting and I agree with your idea that it's all based on property. Uh, do you see any implications of this? I mean, it's intellectually very satisfying providing a solid foundation for a superstructure. But is it more than just theoretically satisfying or do you see that using this base that uh, you could kind of clean up and make logically more consistent the body of law that we do have? I mean, we do have things like the American Law Institute restatements of the law and so on, which kind of go in that direction because the law is not totally consistent between different countries, different legal systems and so on. And uh, you also have things like the Unidroid principles uh, that have been going on since 1926. So there's some value in harmonization of the law. So do you see this foundation that you provided as p p uh, potentially helping in cleaning up practical law as well? Not very much. <laughs> uh, the reason is I think uh, contract law now is would roughly have the same results as the title transfer theory would have. Um, uh, there's no debtor's prison anymore, as far as I know, so that wouldn't be a big difference. Uh, it does help to clarify the, the foundations, and I think it helps put the emphasis back on property rights, which is good. Um, it would have some implications for theories which uh, uh, and, and practices such as the uh, uh, I think it's a Chicago school theory, the uh, efficient breach theory. So what they say is um, if you breach a contract, there should be no punitive damages. You should be able to breach a contract as long as you pay damages because you, if the damages are less than the profit you, you can make from an alternative project, then everyone benefits because you can take your surplus and you can make a profit and take the, take the rest and pay damages to the, to the person you breached. So they believe in the efficient breach theory, which I think a similar result would be reached if you just view these as transfers of title to property. Right, so in a sense, under my theory, there's no such thing as a breach of contract. It's impossible to breach contract because it's not a binding obligation. Uh, there is e there's simply, uh, the contract is used to help identify who the owner of property is. That's, that's all it is. So in that understanding, we would separate in our minds what a promise is. A promise could be a social custom, and if someone breaks their promise, you know, if a, a boy promises to pick a girl up for a date, and doesn't show up, he's going to have a bad reputation, she's going to be mad at him, angry at him. Um, <clears throat> but promise would be separate from the idea of, uh, of, of, of the legal contract. So I just think it's more of a conceptual clarification and to put the emphasis back on, on property as the fundamental right. Uh, and also, as I said, there is a, the danger of some of the thinking that underlies the uh, the justifications given for the conventional theory of, co of, of contract, which is the reliance idea, there's some danger that this can lead to the property theory of value, which can lead to intellectual property justifications. So there are dangers that do arise from thinking about it in the wrong way, that confuses the way people think about other aspects of law. So I think it's important to get it right, but it is in a sense an academic thing, which is interesting to me. What law generally is concerned from a libertarian point of view, um, for me, I always try uh, when, when confronted with things like that, you know, how to look at certain uh, problems, certain conflicts, then um, I have all, always the, 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 the task to think about what, what is the source of law, where does law come from, Namely, once you do not accept anymore that the state gives the law. You know, when, when I argue we do not need a state to have a law order, then the first question that comes is, but who gives the laws? 
or the law or the statutes or however you call it. And then I say we do not need any lawgiver, no legislator, because laws are there. It's, it's, these are natural phenomena, that there are law, laws, that there are rules of behavior, of mutual behavior of, of, of men in society. And, and once you look at um, conflict situations with these classes, then I think it's less important to discuss is this a property-based approach or is this a consent-based approach, but you can see that in this or that situation some reaction comes, some outrage, uh, some, some um, uh, negative reactions that should not have been done. Uh, he, maybe he promised something, then he didn't hold it, and this, this um, creates reactions against it. That's not right. Um, or if somebody injures the other or takes away things from him, then this creates reactions. And what I always want to understand is what, what are these reactions? This is an a interesting phenomenon. If, if, if somebody attacks the others, uh, certainly the whole group will look at it and some will try to intervene and, and some... some hold perhaps the intervener who is too aggressive back again and things like that. So things happen out of certain conflicts and it's interesting to look at these things and to, to try to understand them. And the ultimate goal then for me as a, a law scientist also is, um, is it possible to come as close as possible to the natural reactions to those reactions that are there. Um, the closer we come to them, be it by this or that approach, and the, the closer some judge or some rule maker comes to them, to these very natural rules, the less problems we have. And I think also a lot of, of um, problems just like these very important immigration problems like that um, are, are also um, accessible to this kind of, of approach that um, once reactions that are very normal do not take place because some political authority hinders them, then we have... Um, um, you know, problems, then these reactions go to other parts, they maybe um, become overreactions and things like that because the natural reactions are blocked. So this is just a, maybe to make a link between contract law and immigration problem. But I think this, this has to do with the question, what is law? I have a question uh, for Hans or the panel. Um, do you guys have any strategic advice on the popularization of these ideas? No, no, no other idea than to publish it. So that's it. That's all I ever, ever did. All I will ever be able to do. Um, uh, I have a question for Stefan or for Professor Hopper or um, any a member of the panel which who wants to talk about libertarianism and law. Um, uh, are you familiar with the general direction that Frank Van Dunn is taking? Uh, he's uh, he he says he is building on libertarianism, um, placing it in a more medieval context. He's come to the view that. Um, for him, libertarianism isn't a legal system, and it's not a philosophy of rights, but a philosophy of law. Um, and it's, he, he bases this on an idea of a common conscience. Um, I, I'm not too well versed in it myself, but I wonder if anyone on the panel is familiar with it and has any thoughts. I think I'm uh, roughly familiar with Van Dunn's work. Um, and I think we have uh, 
a large, dis large extent we agree on these matters, um, especially because we are both committed to this ethics of argumentation, uh, which of course implies that there is a, uh, a conscience, that, that, this is, that, that people have the same knowledge. He emphasizes always conscience in the sense not of the, as a Protestant's belief in a conscience, whatever your conscience tells you, um, but as, uh, as the word indicates, conscience is something that is shared, it is co shared knowledge. Um, and, uh, and people who are engaged in argumentation, of course, share a certain things, otherwise they would not even begin doing it. Uh, and Dunn's work is not completed yet, I st he, he still keeps writing, I, I try to follow his work, um, but by and large, I think I'm uh, in, in agreement with, with his work. I just want to pick up the discussion of legal theory and I want to challenge so Professor Durr that you want to rely on people's reactions uh, as guidance for uh, the evolution of law and that's certainly a factor but that just would deliver a kind of umbrella of disconnected individual cases and reactions and that's not uh, what a system of law can be built out. I don't believe in lawgivers either and it's going to be a convergence and an evolution but an evolution in which legal scholarship and discourse and con discursive convergences of a, a, a jurisprudence literature has a lot to impact and speak towards. And I think, uh, with Stephen, um, uh, the kind of withdrawal, or this is just academic and its impact downstream into, into that various particular legal theorems and position is kind of uh, not to be expected. I would challenge that too. I know that you're not quite, uh, you would elaborate and you all can, most probably can turn the corner on this, but, but I think there is, of course, the value of integrating uh, under sort of principles all these judgments and have same principles applied to the same cases is, is deeply in, important. And that would, uh, and the more cleaning up kind of conceptualization and building and, and unifying and systematizing a system of law is a very important value which everyone has to kind of praise and value against uh, the particular theorems one wants to kind of catch and derive from this. But of course, the theorems themselves, if the uh, uh, derives become proven to be impractical and problematic, one that would have to feed back and reverse engineer the system structure, the deductive system quasi-deductive system, which I call an inference machine, which needs to corroborate itself in a process of delivering verdicts, which feedback, and one of the, the, the populist reactions is one, but well, that can't be, is only one of many factors. There isn't a root, there isn't a kind of found, root foundation here, but it's a series of factors when a praise and overall, if there's a headline, overall headline is a kind of pragmatism, but long-term rural utilitarianism and pragmatism, which has many factors to take into account, one of which is conceptual consistency as a value with pragmatic consequences. And I think this meta-reflection of what's the status of a legal theory needs to be understood, otherwise it becomes kind of fetishistic uh, investment in a, in a kind of mythical think-through process as delivering justice. These are all obviously uh, unsound and unsophisticated in the contemporary world. Uh, conceptions, and that would be just my contribution to this conversation. <laughs> uh, again, a short question and a short answer. Um, it, it, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very important point, generally, when you, you talk about or you think about law, um, and namely if you try to take the approach I, I, I sketched before, um, I think that um, when I, I, I talk about action and reaction or things like that, then um, this is not only true for a small situation like one neighbor um, blaming the other or hurting the other and so on, but um, it's also true for over-individual um, uh, 
um, constellations. It is also true for problems and constellations that are over the time um, bigger than just one um, conflict. So I think that even what theory of law and science of law and discussions about concepts of law and things like that are concerned, this too, I would say, is a product of nature. Um, you, you could say of culture, but um, one could take an approach that culture is a part of nature. Maybe you would not say so, but uh, um, this, this is how I look at it. And therefore, I think even those theoretical points that are very important, mainly if it's, it's in international levels or so, that even these points are accessible to the approach to look at how it works. Um, if you can see that there are some international discussions or tensions or things like that out of certain conflict situations, then it's not by accident, so, but because these are reactions out of this. Or if different um, um, law systems in different countries collide with each other. This too is a collision which leads to certain discussions as a reaction out of this. And uh, of course then on that level it's very difficult to be aware that discussion, discussions one's, one's, one's having here are not something separate from reality but part of reality. And, and so I think this, this too, you can choose this approach to get to these bigger questions. And also perhaps a point, this understanding is um, not a, a state, um, it's a dynamic optic. I choose, so law is not, some, not, not something that is there and is defined and this is the right thing and must be applied. <coughs> but it's how are reactions in something in move. And the world and the history and society is permanently in move and, and so also this, this law approach is a dynamic one. It's an element of empiricis, as if there was a kind of crucial experiment of a reaction, but these deserve to be interpreted, they are data points which need to be extracted from a generalized form, so we can't develop the theory uh, uh, feedback, violent, and so you just simply just going for a criticism of reaction. I just thought, you know, for a short question, short answer, and uh, this is what what, what <coughs> came out. Maybe uh, one of the big dangers or risks in these things is that somebody, some authorities, then assume the competence to to administer these truths, and and this is the the beginning of the end. Uh, yes. Now, uh, first of all, I want to support John Gap's suggestion that uh, this speech should be as widely spread as possible. And, and we surely will do what we can in Germany uh, to spread it because I think it could have a, a major impact. Uh, it is a real manifesto and um, I, I hadn't expected it to be as realistic as it is because it also addresses the means to achieve something. And um, in parts, that at least, please correct me if I'm wrong, in parts is, it can also be used as a populist uh, manifesto. And we mustn't forget that um, a major breakthrough uh, of the last uh, few years uh, has been the emergence of populist movements in the West. Uh, not just in England, in America, also in Germany now. Uh, election come in September, we will for the first time have a few libertarian uh, people in, in German Parliament, like uh, Mr. Böhringer from Munich, just to give one example. Um, it's, um, uh, this is something 
I think we can uh, build on. And um, just to add a few things from a German perspective, to, uh, to cite uh, or to construct yeah, a conflict between cosmopolitan and parochial attitudes um, doesn't convince me. For instance, the top candidate of the, this new German uh, populist party has lived in China, speaks fluently Mandarin, has worked for Goldman Sachs. She's completely uh, cosmopolitan, the same way I am cosmopolitan, but she's against mass uh, migration. And it's not true that it's mainly left out people. Uh, for instance, the um, Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, who, who probably will come out as third strongest party. I mean, we have never had this before. Um, and um, their, um, uh, the people who elect them are slightly above average regarding their income, yeah? and they uh, draw people from all uh, parts of society. And what's even more interesting, um, if you look at their age, yeah, uh, their, their, ma their main uh, support comes from uh, people between 35 and 44. Yeah, because these are people who uh, think about their future. The very old people uh, are being bribed by uh, higher pensions and so on, and the very young people don't uh, uh, believe in... But there's another point which uh, Professor Hopper referred to, this ext and, and this was... Uh, I hadn't thought about it. Uh, up to 30 years a person can spend in state uh, education. Yeah? And this, of course, might explain why the uh, ruling parties uh, are to much, more, to much more extent elected by people coming from universities. Yeah? So the populist movement, and this is what I would uh, like to ask you, uh, isn't it an advantage and a possibility because uh, compared to populist parties, uh, libertarians are a very, very small uh, force, a small minority. Isn't this a point where to start uh, doing something? And my last remark, uh, it is really, uh, um, I really noticed that over the last one or two years, um, you can speak more openly in Germany. Not completely, but discussion, discussion has started to open up and the ruling class and populism is nothing else but a movement confronting the ruling class. That's the only sensible definition. And the ruling class, in Germany at least, yeah, starts being afraid of them, and they start being on the defensive. So I think we really have new possibilities. I expect that this article will be translated into German. Um, and um, uh, one gets spread around. I hope it will inspire some, some people. Um, I should add something to your remark about the demographics supporting the alternative for Germany. This applies, by the way, also to the Trump victory in the United States. Of course, in German papers, it is presented as if the dum-dums and the deplorables all voted for Trump. Uh, the opposite is the truth. The average income of Trump supporters was significantly higher than the average income of the Democrats. And um, the entire underclass in the United States, of course, votes traditionally 
for the Democrats. So Hillary was elected by the, de well, would have been elected by the deplorables and uh, not so much Trump. My reservations against Trump I have made quite clear. There must be a distinction made between the movement that brought Trump to power and Trump himself. I think Trump, of course, himself turned out a major, major disappointment. Uh, his foreign policy uh, is a disaster. Um, and, uh, uh, and even when it comes to combating political correctness, which he did during his campaign, um, even that has, has somewhat declined. So a difference has to be made between the mood in the country that brought him to power and the actual policies that he, that he now conducts. But to <laughs> downgrade uh, those sections of the populace who brought him to power as being the dum-dums and uh, um, uh, the intellectually uh, handicapped people uh, seems to be clearly a misrepresentation of the truth. So you think that within this um, group I can collect my class plaintiffs against the Swiss government, class action plaintiffs? So if you take not the, the political but the legal approach, then that would be the plaintiffs. You probably have to be a Swiss citizen in order to uh, join the suit. No, 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 no. So my concept would be all those that are forced to, to, to obey to these Swiss regulations just because of the fact that they put their feet on Swiss ground are entitled to this class action. Um, so if you as a tourist in Switzerland are... Um, under this problem, or somebody who just lives in Switzerland but without being a citizen? Well, that's, that's no. But now just to, 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 because we are discussing about the, a movement or about the group of the population that, that is, is, is ready or that is, um, is interested and this, uh, at this uh, libertarian approach, then I think. Um, for, for that concept, that would be the plaintiffs. For a political movement, that would be maybe a party. Um, but maybe this is the part of the, pop of the, the society that is uh, our, our supporters. Yeah, I have no doubt that that is the case. Um, I think with this, we will... Can I one, 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 one last question? One more. Okay, Very one, short one. Very short. Uh, Dr. Daniels, uh, on, on, the, on the topic of political correctness in medical journals or even medical policies, um, in Hong Kong and in many other jurisdictions, uh, they have banned nicotine uh, liquids that for, for electronic cigarettes. And in some jurisdictions, they haven't banned it. And in Hong Kong, basically the word nicotine, they would just ban it. Um, <laughs> I, I went on radio to argue uh, against uh, who I call the Taliban and then subsequently got banned by the radio, um, the anti-smokers, because they hear the word nicotine and they want it banned too. But uh, um, there are scientific evidence, I guess, I'm guessing, uh, that these electronic cigarettes saves lives because it would, be, it would be a substitute to real cigarettes and there are 10,000 other substances apart from nicotine. When does, I mean, are there, are there areas in medicine that is especially political correctness have corrupted, uh, such as the study of nicotine or, or, or cigarette smoking, uh, in which, and how can we fight back to have a more rational discussion with the other people who doesn't believe in like libertarianism? Uh, well, uh, certainly one um, hobby horse of mine is opiate and opioid addiction, which seems to me uh, there's a, uh, there's a, um, uh, uh, a lot of political correctness, or at least a suppression of, uh, I'm not saying that there's a direct, that there's a conspiracy, uh, but there is suppression of, uh, of argument about it. Um, 
and in fact, really, the whole of psychiatry uh, has many such um, uh, many such um, uh, fields. So that, for example, to just to take our whole system of uh, psychiatric diagnosis um, is uh, is almost a taboo subject. Uh, and it's interesting to, for lawyers, perhaps, that lawyers believe in our current system of classification as if it were a scientific rather than uh, something that is more or less imposed by uh, fiat of, uh, of various committees. And they believe, in, uh, they believe in the validity of this classification uh, with a kind of superstition that makes the average uh, Latin American peasant uh, going to have to pray uh, at a miracle working virgin for the uh, preservation of his pig, uh, it makes it look completely rational. <laughs> so uh, there is that. And of course, uh, there are there are really many fields where uh, it's very difficult to get alternative views aired. Um, that's all I. That's what I can say. <laughs>